Bolivian authorities have condemned the fake news published by a Brazilian newspaper, which claims that the country is a drug trafficking paradise. This Friday saw a hearing in London on the crimes committed by the United States government against WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. The Russian foreign minister met with his Bolivian counterpart in Moscow on Friday, where they discussed foreign interference in Latin America and the Caribbean. From the headquarters of Teleso English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south, and I'm Katrina Goss. We begin in Bolivia, where authorities have rejected the fake news published by a Brazilian newspaper, which claims that the country is a drug trafficking paradise. Our correspondent, Freddy Morales, brings us the details. The Bolivian Vice Minister of Social Defense, accompanied by the main police authorities in charge of the fight against drug trafficking, denied that the criminal organization, first commando of the capital, known by its acronym PCC, was operating with absolute impunity in the Andean country. Organizations of such characteristics do not exist in Bolivia. Therefore, we emphatically reject the report of the newspaper O Estado de Sao Pablo that labels our state as a sanctuary for drug trafficking. We, the Bolivian state, exercise sovereign control over the entire national territory. Intelligence reports from the Special Force for the Fight Against Drug Trafficking assure that there are no drug trafficking cartels operating in our territory. The first commando of the capital is considered an illegal organization in Brazil. It emerged in the 1990s to defend the rights of prisoners at the Taubaté Penitentiary and later became a criminal organization linked to drug trafficking. There is a clear campaign to discredit Bolivia's anti-drug trafficking policy that unfortunately is being replicated by some media outlets, misinforming the Bolivian population. The official report states that at least six actions attributed or claimed by the Brazilian PCC in Bolivian territory in the last six years with spectacular assaults and more than 162 assault rifles, submachine guns and pistols seized. It was noted that the images published to support the Paulista newspaper's version do not correspond to reality. They show some images as if they were at the Viru Viru airport in Santa Cruz. However, one can check the images against reality and they are also untruthful. We are awaiting a formal response from the Brazilian government on this alleged information. It was verified that photographs claimed to have been taken at the Santa Cruz airport do not coincide with those taken inside the air terminal. Among the actions against drug trafficking attributed to the first command in the capital, two helicopters and at least four light aircraft were seized this year, as well as significant quantities of cocaine, and several Brazilians wanted by the Brazilian justice system were deported. The government announced that it would sue the Sao Paulo's newspaper for defamation. Freddy Morales, Telesur, Bolivia. As measures against the COVID-19 pandemic begin to be lifted in many countries, the death toll of health professionals is coming to light. The World Health Organization reported on Thursday that 80 to 180,000 healthcare workers may have been killed up by COVID-19 up to May this year and insisted, insisted that they must be prioritized for vaccination. While slamming the continued global inequity in the vaccine rollout, the WHO Director General stressed that more than 10 months after the first vaccines were approved, the fact that millions of healthcare workers have still not been vaccinated is in itself a condemnation of the countries and companies that control the global vaccine supply. Data from 119 countries suggests that on average, two in five health and care workers globally are fully vaccinated. But of course, that average masks huge differences across regions and economic groupings. In Africa, less than one in 10 health workers have been fully vaccinated. Meanwhile, in most high-income countries, more than 80% of health workers are fully vaccinated. The G20 countries must fulfill their dose-sharing commitments immediately. Manufacturers must prioritize and fulfill their contracts with COVAX and AVAT as a matter of urgency. 
Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro announced on Thursday that the country will begin the production of Cuba's Abdallah vaccine against COVID-19 in January 2022 after a meeting with Cuban Deputy Prime Minister Ricardo Cabrisas. In a press conference following the meeting, the Venezuelan president stressed that 56% of the country's population has already been immunised against COVID-19 thanks to the support of Cuba in providing vaccine doses. In December, another 16 million doses of the Cuban vaccine are expected to arrive in Venezuela in order to complete the vaccination scheme. We are thinking of producing the Cuban vaccine in Venezuela, and coordinations has already been made, so in January to be in condition. In January, with a vaccine production plant that was an investment of our commander Hugo Chavez of the world's greatest technology, already coordinated with the scientific institutions of Cuba and produced the Abdala vaccine in Venezuela. We are and we'll be right back after this very short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. This Friday, a hearing was held on the crimes committed by the United States government against WikiLeaks founder and editor Julian Assange. The hearing convened by the Progressive International Organization took place after the revelation of the CIA plot to kidnap and assassinate Assange while he was in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. The event, titled the Belmarsh Tribunal, comes ahead of Assange's extradition proceedings, which are set to continue in London's High Court from October 27th to 28th. The Belmarsh Tribunal is an instance based on the Russell Sartre People's Tribunal, established to investigate the United States' intervention in the Vietnam War. The tribunal brought together leading figures in politics, law and journalism to shed light on the US crimes that were revealed by WikiLeaks and also to discuss the crimes committed against Assange after exposing those crimes. the tribunal from Moscow. He stressed that Julian Assange's only crime has been to tell the unspeakable truth against all odds. When I came forward in 2013, uh, I said the reason that I came forward uh, was that we have a right to know uh, that which is done to us and that which is done in our name by our governments. Uh, That was already under threat. And when you look at the world since, uh, it, it seems that that trend is accelerating. Do we still have that right? Do we have any rights uh, if we don't defend them? Well, today we see someone who has stood up to defend that right, uh, who has aggressively championed that right at an extreme cost. Uh, and it's time for us to defend his rights. He has consistently and continuously dared to speak the unspeakable in the face of opposition, uh, in the face of power. And that is a remarkable and rare thing. That is the reason that Julian Assange sits in prison today. And Assange's partner, Stella Morris, underlined that what has been done to Julian forms part of the strategies developed under the so-called war on terror. What's being done to Julian is part of a continuum that started with the war on terror. Uh, uh, chipping away at individual rights and freedoms. Uh, the Extradition Act that is being used against Julian is actually a tool of the War on Terror. It was enacted in 2003 um, to make it easier to extradite people. And um, we have to see what is being done to him through the prism of the War on Terror, the tools that were developed through the War on Terror. Julian was the, single, the person who, in our generation, has done the most to expose the war on terror. And the war on terror isn't just about illegal wars. It's not just about institutionalizing torture and rendition. It's about bringing home that uh, dismantlement of our rights. Also addressing the hearing, Tarek Ali, historian and original member of the Russell Sartre Tribunal, recalled the role of Western powers in silencing the crimes committed during the Vietnam War. He also stressed that Assange exposed a war on terror carried out by the US, and for that reason, he's been the target of US attacks. Now, Julian exposed another set of wars, 
Basically, he exposed the so-called war on terror, which began after 9-11, has lasted 20 years, has led to six wars, millions killed, trillions wasted. So what do you say to people like Chelsea Manning and Julian, who's the principal target of the legal and judicial brutalities taking place? Jeremy Corbyn, member of the UK Parliament and founder of the Peace and Justice Project, referred to the invasion of Afghanistan and the media campaigns that manipulated international opinion regarding that war. Corbyn also criticised the media narratives that went unchecked and stressed the role of Julian Assange in exposing them. Of the media and of real journalists is absolutely enormous in that. And Julian Assange has um, paid a very, very, very high price for his um, lifelong determination to expose the truth. Why? Is it because he has some idea that he can make himself famous by exposing the truth? Or is it something much stronger and much more moral than that? The belief that by exposing the truth, you can save lives, you can stop wars, and you can make sure that um, democracies function properly by holding all public officials, elected or unelected, to public account. And that's why the role of Julian Assange in all of this is so important. Former Ecuadorian President Rafael Correa once again denounced the abuses Assange suffered during his stay in Ecuador's London embassy under the presidency of Lenin Moreno. Lenin Moreno had offered to hand over Julian Assange to the United States in exchange for financing. Then what Julian Assange was really subjected to was torture in the Ecuadorian embassy, mistreating him, taking away a lot of services, right to communication, internet, deliberately spying on him and pushing him to decide to leave the embassy by his own means, which they failed to do. Finally, after a brutal inhumane harassment undermining Julian Assange's human rights, for the first time in history, a government allows an armed forces to enter its embassy to capture Assange, and the Ecuadorian state hands over Julian Assange. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break. Stay with us. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov met with his Bolivian counterpart, Rogelio Maite, in Moscow on Friday, where they discussed foreign interference in Latin America and the Caribbean. Cooperation on nuclear development for peaceful purposes, the fight against the pandemic and areas of commercial interest were also discussed. The two foreign ministers called for the immediate cessation of foreign interference in the internal affairs of Latin American countries, including Cuba and Venezuela. For his part, the Bolivian foreign minister reiterated his country's gratitude for the permanent cooperation and gestures of friendship of the Russian government. Dear Mr. Minister, dear colleagues, I am glad to have you in Moscow and I would also like to know that we have already met in New York during our meeting with President Arce and I would like to welcome you here in Moscow. The pandemic did not hinder the cooperation in the progressive development of our relations and our presidents in the last month spoke three times and set the steps to develop our cooperation in its entirety. We have already agreed on the direction of cooperation in peaceful use of atomic energy and also in the field of trade, in the humanitarian sphere and also in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. And the Bolivian Foreign Minister thanked Russia for its valuable cooperation during the pandemic and highlighted the quality of the vaccines developed in Russia. It is said that in difficult times you know who your friends really are and in a difficult time of the pandemic the first country with which we were able to count for possibility of having vaccines against COVID-19 was Russia, and the vaccine was Sputnik V. I want to comment that now, in Bolivia there is a supply of vaccines of different manufacture, but our people have always preferred to be vaccinated with Sputnik V. Palestinians living in Syria and their compatriots in the occupied territories have been rallying in support of the prisoners on hunger strike in Israeli jails. We have more details in the following report with our correspondent Hisham Wanas. 
The leaders of the Alliance of Palestinian Forces in Syria convened a meeting in Damascus to coordinate the measures to be taken against the escalating aggressions of the Israeli occupation against Palestinian prisoners. In addition to organizing protests, the participants condemned the silence of the global community in the face of the Israeli crimes, declared a general state of alarm, and stated that all options are on the table to save the prisoners, including military actions. We reaffirm the support of all Palestinian forces and factions based in Syria for the prisoners and at the same time condemn the silence of the international organizations led by the United Nations and its Human Rights Council. In the face of this criminal and savage action by the Zionist entity and its inhuman oppressive measures against all detainees, in particular those who went on hunger strike. Preparations are currently on the way to negotiate a prisoner exchange agreement, and this agreement will not be the end of our struggle, as all Palestinian forces are committed to uniting their efforts and continuing this struggle using all means at their disposal until all Palestinian prisoners are released. Meanwhile, representatives of the Palestinian community in Syria organized a sit-in protest in front of the headquarters of the Red Cross in Damascus. The demonstrators, in support of the hunger strike carried out by the imprisoned brothers in Israeli jails, handed over the letter of protest to the organization and called on all human international organizations and human and prisoners' rights institutions to mediate in order to stop the oppressive practices of the Israeli occupation against the detainees. We demand that the Red Cross send an urgent medical mission to monitor the health condition of the prisoners who went on hunger strike and to keep track on the detainees isolated in prisons of the Israeli occupation. And we ask this organization to exert pressure to stop the escalation of Israeli violence against the prisoners of the Islamic Jihad. In addition to the popular protests, the Palestinian resistance factions have the option of kidnapping Israeli soldiers to force the occupation authorities to negotiate prisoner exchange agreements. Likewise, in case they do not succeed in this way, and in case the Zionists continue with their inflexibility of not responding to the demands of the prisoners, we have other options and that resistance will not stand idle. The Zionist occupation regime increased the repressive measures against the Palestinian prisoners. After the escape last September, the six of six of them from the Gilboa prison and their recent capture, an aggressive escalation in the face of which 250 detainees of the Islamic Jihad movement in Palestine have been on hunger strike for 10 days, while seven others have been without food or liquids for almost three months. The prisoners, although suffering from very difficult health conditions, continue with the hunger strike through which they seek to unite the Palestinian people in the struggle for the release of the nearly 5,000 inmates suffering from harsh conditions of detention, including 41 women, 225 children, and some 600 prisoners in need of urgent medical attention. And we've come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many of our stories on our website at telesoenglish.net. You can also follow us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Telegram. For Telesoenglish, I'm Katrina Goss. Thank you for watching.